Welcome to the Gospel Doctrine Helps class, where we provide you with insights, quotes, references, and help for your Gospel Doctrine class. Welcome back to another episode of Gospel Doctrine Helps, where we look to help you with your Gospel Doctrine class. And today, we are looking at Old Testament lesson number 37. We are talking essentially about the chapters in Isaiah 20 through 30. And it really gives you certain uh, verses and chapters to look at in the lesson. So if you're looking at the lesson, the lesson's called, Thou Hast Done Wonderful Things. Well, if you've got your Old Testament with you and you pull out Isaiah, we're going to look specifically in um, Isaiah 20. So if you want to look at that, that's great. I'm going to skip over that. 21, I'm going to skip over. And I'm going to go to chapter 22. And we're going to look at verses 22 and 23. These verses have been quoted by Bruce R. McConkie and several other general authorities as pointing to the Savior. So I will read verses 21, 22, 23, and then we'll talk about them a little bit. Uh, Isaiah 22, And I will clothe him with thy robe, and strengthen him with thy girdle, and I will commit thy government into his hand. And he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and to the house of Judah. And the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder, so he shall open, and none shall shut, and he shall shut, and none shall open. Verse 23, and I will fasten him as a nail in a sure place, and he shall be for a glorious throne to his father's house. So what we're looking at here is a reference to the Savior and the crucifixion of the Savior, as well as he having a key. Now, there's two ideas of keys. One is a key of knowledge, and one is a key that opens a door or is able to, a key holder is able to open a door for salvation for someone else. Think about Christ. In the book of Revelations, he talks about having the keys of death and hell. Because Christ overcame death, he has the key to open the door for you to be resurrected. And he does that for all of us. So it says the key of the house of David because David is, a, is the ancestor of Christ. Um, Christ was a descendant of David and of the house of Jesse. He says, I will lay upon his shoulder, meaning a mantle, a responsibility, and he will open, right? He will open that no one else can shut. A few verses to look at that um, correspond to this. One is found in 2 Nephi 9.41. So if you've got your Book of Mormon, you can pull that out. 2 Nephi 9.41. And um, this should be... Uh, easy reading for all of you. Oh, then, my beloved brethren, this is, of course, Nephi uh, speaking, come unto the Lord, the Holy One. Remember that his paths are righteous. Behold, the way for man is narrow, but it lieth in a straight course before him. And the keeper of the gate is the Holy One of Israel, and he employeth no servant there. And there is none other way, save it be by the gate, for he cannot be deceived, for the Lord God is his name. You see, Christ, because he holds the key, he is the only one that you must pass through in order to get into heaven. You can't get there by some unauthorized means or some unauthorized way. You can't go in the back door. You've got to go in the front door. That's a straight and narrow path. And the path is righteous. So it's living a righteous life. It's repenting and following him because he is the keeper of the gate the Nephi clearly explains that he employeth no servant there. There's no servants. There's no St. Peter. It's only Christ. He can't be deceived. He knows your heart. We are all connected to him through this creation. And the Lord God is his name. Uh, there's also one other verse I wanted to look at in this one. It's another one that we're all familiar with, but I think it corresponds perfectly with this. Christ being the one who saves us. Mosiah 3 uh, 17. And uh, King, this is from King Benjamin's uh, epic discourse. He says, And moreover, I say unto you that there shall be no other name given, nor any other way nor means whereby salvation can come unto the children of men, only in and through the name of Christ, the Lord Omnipotent. Uh, again, King Benjamin explaining with very simple, clear words that it is through Christ we are saved. There's no other name, no other person. It is only through Christ. 
and I will fasten him as a nail in a sure place. And this, of course, is good to explain to all those who don't understand. Christ has seven marks in his body. He has nail prints in his palms and in his wrists. Um, and so a sure place, obviously being in the wrist, the nail in the sure place, according to the scripture. And he shall be for a glorious throne to his father's house. So um, in Revelations, and shoot, I'm not going to turn there right now. We don't have time. But you can look up the verse where it talks about that he who overcomes will sit with him in his throne, just like he is going to sit in his father's throne, moving up uh, into the uh, realm of heaven. So I'm going to skip. Oh, there's one other reference. Times and Seasons, volume 5, page 748, also refers to um, verses 22 and 23. If you've got that, you can look it up. You can also do an internet search and find that. Now, moving on to chapter 23. Um, this is interesting because we talk. We are now going to talk about ordinances and how important ordinances are in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we'll talk about baptism because that's a fundamental ordinance. Everyone understand it, understands it, and it's important because it's an essential ordinance. All right, verses 4 and 5 of chapter 23. Um, this is Isaiah prophesying about the end of times, the last days, and how corruption is going to take over. Uh, verses 4, 5, and 6 says, The earth mourneth and fadeth away. The, worth, the world languisheth and fadeth away. The haughty people of the earth do languish. The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof, because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore hath the curse devoured the earth, and they that dwell therein are desolate. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and few men left. So there's a lot in these three verses. Um, the first thing I'd want to, to bring up is that the earth keeps the commandments, right? The earth abides by a celestial law, but us, uh, men, women, we sin, we err, and we don't abide by that celestial law. And so this, this world is a fallen world. And I bring this up because the earth is defiled because of the inhabitants they're on. It's because of us that the earth is cursed and defiled. And it says that how um, covenants are broken, right? Broken the everlasting covenant. Why? Because they change the ordinance. So let's talk about baptism because it's a fundamental one. It's easy. And then we'll do some other references. And I've got a teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith quote I'll give to you or a couple quotes. When you are baptized. Christ set forth the mode of baptism when he came to the earth and even before in the time of Adam. And we could read this in uh, the book of Moses uh, in the Pearl of Great Price. It talks about how Adam was baptized and it's done. Baptism is to submerge into the water and then come out of the water. And there is deep symbolic meaning behind that. One of which is that you will all, all of us will die. So just as Christ died and was resurrected from the grave, it is symbolic of us dying and being resurrected also. We're, we're resurrected with Christ. There's a, a great verse that Peter brings up, talks about that as well. Another, another symbolic meaning is that you are burying or, or your old self is dying and you're being reborn as a disciple of Christ, a follower of Christ. So those are, those are, that's a good example. So what happens if you no longer are baptized by immersion? What if instead, you know what, gosh, you've, you've got some bad legs. You know what, you probably have arthritis. You're older. Let's just get a bucket of water and let's dump it on you. And that can be your baptism. And then you know what, there's so much water you might drown or we're going to make a mess over here. So let's just get a, a smaller basin or a bowl and you know what? We'll bless the water and we'll just sprinkle it on you from above and we'll call that baptism. And you know what? Gosh darn it, kids, uh, if they don't get baptism, they, they might be damned to hell or they'll go somewhere else. So heck, we ought to start baptizing little infants and, and babies and children, right? Because they need baptism too. You see how you can go from wanting to do something good by changing an ordinance and ending up doing something horrible because Christ sets forth how the ordinance is to be performed. And who can change baptism? Who can change baptism? Only Christ could change baptism because he's the one who set it out. He's the one who said, this is the ordinance. If you change the ordinance, you break the covenant. 
So let me give you some uh, examples, and we'll start with Teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith. So if you've got your copy of that, I've got mine here, and I'm going to look at page 308 in Teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith. Uh, two quotes here. Um, this, of course, is a discourse that he gave um, in, uh, sheesh, I don't even have down when it was when it was done. I want to say 1843, but I could be wrong. Let me just double check. And, oh gosh, this is a long one. Um, yeah, doc, it, it's also found, so this was done on July 9th, 1843. And this is also found in History of the Church, Volume 5, page 498 through 500. This is talk Joseph Smith gave. Uh, this is what he says. Uh, it was the design of the councils of heaven before the world was that the principles and laws of the priesthood should be predicated upon the gathering of the people in every age of the world. So he's talking about the gathering, right? Jesus did everything to gather the people and they would not be gathered. And he therefore poured out curses upon them. Okay, now here's one of the important parts. Ordinances instituted in the heavens before the foundation of the world in the priesthood for the salvation of men are not to be altered or changed. All must be saved on the same principles. Okay? What he's talking about here is when before the world was created, there were laws and ordinances put in place. And shoot, if you've got your uh, Doctrine and Covenants, pull it out and look at 130. You're probably all very familiar with this. Um, this is what it says in sheesh, uh, verse 20. There is a law irrevocably decreed in heaven before the foundation of the world, upon which all blessings are predicated. So, if you want to receive a blessing from God, there is a corresponding law that must be obeyed. These were set forth from before this world was created. Verse 21, And when we obtain any blessing from God, it is by obedience to the law upon which it is predicated. You see, it's, it's right there in our scriptures. If we want to be saved, and baptism is a requirement, and Christ set forth how to be baptized, we need to follow exactly the method that he prescribed. We ought not be changing it, because if you change it according to Isaiah, you've broken the covenant. Well, you'd think that'd be great if he, if Joseph Smith mentioned it once, right? He actually mentions it again in the exact same talk. Skipping down a little bit, just over one paragraph, Joseph Smith says, Where there is no change of priesthood, there is no change of ordinances. Says Paul, if God has not changed the ordinances in the priesthood, how ye secretarians? If he has, when and where has he revealed it? Have ye turned revelators? Then why deny revelation? So again, he says, where there is no change of priesthood, there is no change of ordinances. If you change the ordinance, you now have a different type of priesthood, which might be from someone else. Well, there's another quote from Joseph Smith. This is on page 158 of Teachings for the, of the Prophet Joseph Smith. Uh, this is a different talk that he gave. Oh, shoot. I didn't write down the reference for this one either. I think this is earlier on. Yes, this is July 2nd, 1839. Also found in History of the Church, Volume 3, page 383 to 392. This is what um, Joseph Smith said. If there is no change of ordinances, there is no change in priesthood. Wherever the ordinance of the gospel are administered, there is the priesthood. So, again, we're not supposed to be changing the ordinances. You change the ordinances, you've broken the covenant. That's why we still baptize by immersion. And even if you've got a really good reason, like arthritis or you're sick or whatever the reason is, you don't change it. Why? Because God set it forth that way. And if you change it, you're changing the priesthood and you're breaking the covenant. There's other verses you can look at as well that correspond to this. I'll just read them off if you want to look at them and use them. Um, I've got 3 Nephi 11, 28 through 30. That's where he sets forth baptism. Uh, Doctrine and Covenants 1, verse 15. Um, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Jeremiah 31, 36. Um, and then there's also, I had a quote from uh, President Kimball, June 1971. It's on page 18 from Teachings of, the Prophet, uh, uh, Teachings of President Kimball. President Spencer W. Kimball. All right, a few men left. I want to jump to verse 6. Why is it that Isaiah is talking about the, the earth is desolate, the inhabitants are burned, and few men, there are few men left? Few men. Remember, men, the Hebrew word 
um, when it talks about men, if, if there is women present and there's just one man, they use the plural word for men. So this means and does include women as well. It's talking about mankind. So women, if you're listening to this, include yourself in that. Few men and women left would be a better translation. So why is it the end of the world or when we come to the last days that there are very few men and women left? Because very few men and women are willing to do that which God wants them to do. We want to freelance. We have our own uh, our own free agency, our own free will. And by golly, we want to do it our way, right? Well, that's pride and that's arrogance and that's the haughtiness that he's talking about here. And we ought not engage in that folly. We ought to instead follow Christ. I've got a couple other verses where it talks about few men left. Look at uh, 3 Nephi chapter 9, verse 13. You can also reference uh, Joseph Smith history, um, uh, chapter 1, verse 37. Um, all right, I'm going to jump over here to verse 15 of Isaiah 24. Wherefore glorify ye the Lord in the fires, even in the name of the Lord God of Israel, in the isles of the sea. Well, isn't that interesting? Even in the isles of the sea, you can worship God. So if you're in Hawaii or on vacation in the Cayman Islands or somewhere else, Jamaica, wherever you find yourself, you can worship God. All right, let's keep going. Chapter 25. Um, this is where I'm going to spend most of the time is in chapter 25 because it talks about uh, a feast, feast of fat things, and it talks about um, how we can become like Christ because Christ is actually in here. So let's start with verse 1 of 25. O Lord, thou art my God, I will exalt thee, I will praise thy name, for thou hast done wonderful things. Thy counsels of old are faithfulness and truth. So again, we're learning more characteristics about Christ, about our Heavenly Father. Faithfulness and truth. So questions for your class. What does it mean to be faithful to our Heavenly Father? What does it mean to be true? And, and you could go so far as to say, what is truth? And you can reference DNC 93, where it talks about uh, truth is, um, where knowledge is, is light and intelligence and truth uh, is the Spirit of God. Wonderful things. What does it mean we've done wonderful things? Uh, Cross-reference here, Psalms 77, 14 through 15. Um, jumping down to verse 4, For thou hast been a strength to the poor, a strength to the needy in his distress, a refuge from the storm, a shadow from the heat, when the blast of the terrible ones as a storm against the wall. Th think about the imagery that Isaiah is putting forth here. A strength to the poor. How can you be a strength to the poor? How is being strength to the poor being like Christ? How is being Christ-like, taking care of the poor and needy among us. A strength to the needy in his distress. There is no other Christ-like thing that you or I can ever do than to help someone who is truly in distress or in need. When your knee bends in service of someone else who truly needs help, not in a fake, a fake ministering or home teaching or visiting teaching sort of way, but in a true Christ-like fashion where you really want to help another person. That is being like Christ. You will get credit for that like nothing else because that is how you should worship. That is true imitation of our Lord. That is what Christ would do if he was here on the earth. And that's what we ought to do as well. A refuge from the storm. How can you be a refuge for others in the storm? What storms are raging about us? And there's plenty of... Uh, current things in the news that you could talk about there. A shadow from the heat. Think about that, the imagery. Have you ever been in the desert? Have you ever been, uh, have heat exhaustion where you just need water, right? And, and to be in a shadow when the blazing sun is out, how is that refreshing, right? When a blast from the terrible ones is a storm against the wall, how can you protect and bless those who are in need? Uh, another reference for you to look at on this is Psalms 46.1. Um, let's see here. I've got a little note here. Uh, there's another scripture, Doctrine and Covenants 56, 18 through 19, and a reminder that Christ is our refuge from the storm. Christ is also a sanctuary. If you look at Isaiah 8, verse 14, he protects us from the judgment of the wicked. 
Um, there's a lot of great imagery here. Uh, verse 5, um, Thou shalt bring down the noise of strangers, as in the heat of a dry place. Even the heat with the shadow of a cloud, the branch of a terrible ones, shall be brought low. Um, look at Ephesians 2.19, where it talks about strangers. Remember, um, you're no more, once you're part of the body of Christ, you're no more strangers or foreigners, but you're family. You are family. You're part of the family of God. And um, you will be treated that way. You'll be protected. Verse 6. Another reference for verse 6. Well, I've got it. 2 Nephi 26, 33. It says, And in this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make unto all people a feast of fat things, a feast of wines on the lees, of fat things full of marrow, of wines on the lees, well refined. What's the image that comes to your mind when you see the word mountain? What is a mountain? A mountain, of course, is the apex of the earth. It's the point at which the heaven and earth meet. It's a symbolic uh, reference to the temple. It's also what temples were anciently. Um, what else do we have here? A feast of fat things. We've talked about feasts before and having a feast with the Lord. I'll bring up some of those verses. Uh, a feast could also mean a supper with the Lord. When you hear the words supper of the Lord, does that remind you of something we do on Sundays in sacrament meeting? Is he referencing the sacrament where you take bread and water and you remember him? Remember him. Uh, D&C 5811. Also look at Exodus 20 verses 9 through 11. And that's when Moses and um, Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu and 70 of the elders of Israel went up and they all saw the God of Israel and they had a feast with him. Um, there's also, um, ooh, well, that's interesting. Who gets invited to the feast? Let's look at uh, Luke 14. This is an interesting verse, and I think it'd be very appropriate if you feel so inclined or if the Spirit guides you to use these verses um, in, to, in, your, uh, in your discussion, your gospel doctrine class. Luke 14, verse 16 through 24. This is a parable Christ gave. He said, Then said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper and bade many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all these things are now ready. Now, I'm going to stop right here to just bring up the point that when you see the word servant in scriptures, quite often, servant refers to angels. It's the angels who do the gathering. You can look at DNC 77, verse 11. Uh, for some more information about that. Anyway, he sends out his servants, right? Verse 18. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee have me excused. So first person has some earth, some real estate that he's worried about, right? He's got to go check out his real estate. He's worried about his investments. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's a multifamily home, an apartment complex or storage unit, whatever it is. He said unto him, you know, I pray thee have me excused. And verse 19, and another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee have me excused. So the second excuse is oxen, oxen representing uh, perhaps farming, perhaps uh, transportation. I've got a big rig. I've got a nice fancy new car. Uh, whatever it is, right, he wants to be excused from the feast. Verse 20, and another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. Right? He's, he's married a wife. He's got to take care of her. So that's three different excuses. Did you see that? One is with the earth, with the ground, with real estate. One is movement, oxen, right? Perhaps labor. And the third is a family issue, specifically his wife, right? A spouse. Verse 21. So that servant, or angel in this case, came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in hither the poor, the maimed, the halt, and the blind. You see, those who are invited to those, this great feast, they're not interested in coming. They're preoccupied with the things of this world. and They don't have time for Christ. So what does Christ do? He sends his servants or his angels to gather in all those who are on the streets, those who are poor, those who are maimed, those who are halt, and those who are blind. How often, as members of the church, do we look at others, people of other faiths, and we say we're better than them, 
or we're arrogant or haughty or prideful because we have all the fullness of the gospel and they don't have it. And we think somehow that they can't have the spirit of God with them or that they won't be able to be perhaps the blind who don't see what we see or the halt or they're maimed or they're somehow cursed by God. And yet those are the ones that perhaps God goes to. And, and the poor, right? Aren't the poor despised? They don't, they don't wear the suit or the nice dress. They don't have nice shoes on. They don't have the fancy Sunday attire. So perhaps they shouldn't be with us, right? They're poor. Yeah. Anyway, moving on. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. So he brought in the poor. He brought in the maimed, those halt and blind and yet the servant said, there's still room. There's room for some more. And so the Lord says, verse 23, And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. You see, this reckons back to 2 Nephi 26, 33, where he says, All are alike unto God. All are invited. God is no respecter of persons, and every single person is invited to this feast. Well, uh, verse 24, for I say unto you that none of these men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. So those who were asked to go in, the religious, the religious and those who fail to have a connection to Christ, they'll be too busy so they won't come in. They're too busy with other things. So what is the qualifying? You can also, by the way, look at uh, Matthew 22, 1 through 14. That also references a very similar feast that Christ talks about. How is it that we are able to have a meal with the Lord? Well, we need to find a way to become poor, halt, maimed, and blind. Uh, perhaps one of the other verses where he talks about losing your life for my sake and picking up your cross daily and following me. Maybe that has something to do with it. I'd let you have that discussion in your gospel doctrine class. But other verses to look at, John 14, 18, John 14, 23, about how we ought to seek to have a meal with the Lord. And why ought we do that? That's a good question for your class um, because there's a feast. So I'm going to uh, move on here. Verse 8, he will swallow up death in victory and the Lord God will wipe away tears from tears from off all faces and the rebuke of his people shall take away off all the earth for the Lord hath spoken it. Well, what is Isaiah declaring? He will swallow up death in victory. Who swallowed up death other than Christ? Christ is our Savior. Look at um, reference 1 Corinthians 15, 54 to 57, Helaman 14, 14 through 18, Revelation 7, 17, Doctrine and Covenants 101, 29. You see, Christ, he won the victory for us because he was acquainted with grief, which we'll look at in the next one, which is Isaiah 53, verse 3. Um, the Lord will wipe away tears from all of us. There is no pain, there is no suffering, there is no heartache that we will endure in this life that he will not heal us from. This is the time where we are called to repent and come unto Christ and be a partaker with him of eternal life. And we do that by having a meal with him. The meal you have every Sunday is a feast because even small reminders a small piece of bread and a small cup of water can remind us of his atoning sacrifice. And as we ingest it, it becomes part of our physical being. When we drink the water, it is incorporated into our cells, into our bodies. When we, when we eat of the bread, it becomes part of us. So likewise in our lives, Christ's atonement ought to become a part of us. We ought to have Christ living and breathing through us as we live his gospel. I hope that these references and citations and quotes have been helpful to you, and we look forward to seeing you in the next Gospel Doctrine Helps class. Thank you for watching.